Good morning. My name is Tamara Bertrand Jones, and I'm an associate professor of higher education at Florida State University. And I'm a former president of Sisters of the Academy, and I'm very happy to be here this morning to facilitate this panel with fellow brothers of the Academy. To tell you a little bit about our panelists, we have Dr. Lou Matthews, who is the Director of Educational Standards and Accountability here in Bermuda, the Ministry of Education. Dr. Chance Lewis is the Carol Belk Distinguished Full Professor of Urban Education at University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Dr. Gerlando Jackson is the Villas Distinguished Professor of Higher Education and Director and Chief Research Scientist of the We Lab and our Chair of ICBE, ICBME. Next, we have Dr. James L. Moore, who is the Executive Director of the Todd Anthony Bell National Research Center on the African American Male, and also a Distinguished Professor of Urban Education at The Ohio State University. Next to him is Dr. Eric M. Hines, who is an Assistant Professor of School Counseling at the University of Connecticut. And last but not least, Dr. Patrick J. Sims, who is the Vice Provost for Diversity and Climate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Let's give a round of hand for our panelists. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Our talk is gonna center around um, Brothers of the Academy as an organization, and I think it also as a movement um, of scholarship and um, um, sort of inquiry in the Academy. Why was Brothers of the Academy founded? And why do you think we need organizations such as BODA today? It, so the founding of the organization was a serendipitous event. We, we initially were brought together to be a part of a book that was called Brothers, Brothers of the Academy that identified 26 African American males who were up and coming uh, in the academy. And the um, book company arranged several uh, events for us to uh, promote the book. And just the energy in the room was so powerful. Just the connectivity, the ability to talk uh, to one another. It was so moving that we, we felt the need to, to form an organization that would unite us and keep us together going forward, which is why it's called Brothers Academy Institute to distinguish it from the book. And, and that's how it began for us. And since then, it, for many of us, it has been the ways in which we stay connected and done our work uh, collectively. I know, I know for me, I, I came in after that particular first initial movement. I was just talking to some of the brothers. When did you join the academy? And then the three here, it was in 2001. For me, it was 2002. And um, I remember my first conversation at Georgia State University with a, a white professor and friend and colleague now. Um, I was just freshly minted with a PhD in mathematics education got a nice spanking nice job at Georgia State and um, he said to me Lou can you name 10 black men with PhDs in mathematics education in the nation right and I was wondering why he, he, he told me he was asking this question and we got up to five because we did know every black male who was working on a PhD in mathematics education and we could not get to 10 and that was including me. And it then dawned on me, you know, the, 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 the importance and the significance of what black men were being called to accomplish. And given the challenges that we were facing in, at Georgia State, at University of South Carolina, in these predominantly white universities, there was a need for a movement like BODA to help us to network to strengthen us through the movement because there were, at that time, 2002, three, four, there, there was just few, in my field, there were few and far between. And so without the strength, the network of the brothers to help support the movement, it would not have been possible to navigate 
the, the tensions of the academy uh, moving forward. Thank you. How important do you think are organizations like BODA um, in the development of black males in the academy? I think it's very important. Um, the academy, and uh, I brought the, I brought the um, in addition to the book, a documentary was created. And in fact, I brought it with me uh, to share it. Uh, but, and there's some really powerful statements by brothers from around the country. And one in particular, not because he's a dear friend of mine, that always stands out to me is what Jolando said. And Jolando indicated in the documentary uh, to be black and male in the academy is quite lonely. It's almost like being on an island. Uh, I have lots of friends with a lot of education, but many of them don't work in the academy, and they still think I write book reports. They reduce my work to book reports rather than spend, because they can't understand that you spend all of this time and they see a paper, That's you spent all of your time and you wrote that paper. They don't know the, the developments of it. And in many of our fields, we suffer from that island because we either alone the continuum, uh, the first, the only, and seen as the best. Mm -hmm. Not among the, all groups, but within the group. And so um, what many of us, natural we're an organization, but natural like all organizations, people connect based on personality, research lines, et cetera. And it's a group of us. Uh, we kind of, you know, Jolando, we've written extensively, Chance and I've written extensively, and there's some others. Uh, we kind of develop a, a special bond. And so the bond goes beyond just producing scholarship and research. Um, we talk about issues with our own children. We talk about what credit cards we should have. We talk about investments. We talk about our retirements. Um, we have a saying we haven't had it here. Um, uh, and I think it emerged because some of us didn't drink, uh, but we all like tea, and we call it tea time. And tea time is, 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 is a therapeutic space. I think it kind of refers to what um, Brother Douglas talks about, crossing borders. But for us, the barbershop, we don't have the chance to go to the barbershop, but we have tea time and is somewhat reflective of barbershop talk. I will add another comment. When, when you look at Boda at the time, it was established when, I mean, basically all of us were junior scholars just trying to find our way. Uh, having an organization that was uh, put together around collective research and scholarship was huge because being the only in the institution or one of few like many are here in the room. Uh, when I got together with the, with the fellas, you know, it gave me new energy when I went back to my campus to, to write more, you know, to bring something to the table when we have these tea times uh, because the, the strategies that we were trying to put together to find our way, you know, because the, the academy has a lot of unwritten rules and so what we tried to do is figure a lot of them out, you know, through our therapeutic conversations with each other. You know, how do we position ourselves to, you know, get into the top journals so our work can have impact? You know, how do we take our scholarship to the community? You know, how do we, you know, navigate the tenure and promotion process? And uh, these are conversations that many people can not have with colleagues, you know, in their hallways at their institutions. So it was, it was really therapeutic, you know, for me, you know, at that particular time to uh, push forward and, and produce good work uh, as well. I'll simply add, uh, from my vantage point, um, it was an, a space and an opportunity to collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, my, my discipline is not the traditional discipline when we think of uh, gatherings like this. So I represent the arts and humanities. And I think about the role that the Harlem Renaissance played the early 20th century for us and how there was this intersection 
of art, of appreciation of culture, of rigorous debate and thought. And uh, I was looking for a space to engage that, and I wanted to have that opportunity to also demonstrate the rigor of my discipline, which often sometimes is viewed as less rigorous when you think of the arts and exploratory kinds of conversations, that it is rigorous, and it is essential, in my opinion, to how we communicate in the 21st century. Right, because the idea of a face-to-face -face conversation, the ability to look somebody in the eye and to stand on a particular conviction, uh, my opinion, there are few folk in far in between who have that skill and capacity and are willing to make that kind of commitment public. Uh, I saw the Brothers of the Academy as that space where people were making those commitments and they were doing so unabashedly in a way that was not apologetic, but also very focused on what it meant to be black and what it meant to represent a standard of excellence. And so when you have that as the, the goal and you see brothers hitting it out the park, like, I want to get down too. So that, that's how I thought about the experience. I, I think you hit the nail on the head, seeing the standard of excellence. And I got an opportunity to see it as an undergraduate working for Dr. Jones. The, the reason why I am in, a, in the academy is because of these brothers here, I got to see them come up the ranks from junior professors all the way to full distinguished and endowed chairs. I remember working in the student support services at Florida State, and I saw a whole bunch of brothers walking with shirt and ties, bow ties, looking like they were about their business. And I, wanted to, and I told myself, I wanted to be just like these guys. I was aspiring only to get a master's degree and become a school counselor. But throughout the years, having conversations with these gentlemen up here and other gentlemen and the Brothers of the Academy, it gave me an opportunity to think about research, think about how much impact I will have in the Academy, getting a PhD and also helping other young brothers get through the process. The other piece that I got to see is uh, really thinking about how writing will be impactful for our community. I remember Chance and James giving me my first writing opportunity as a master's student. They, they were doing a special issue, and James said, here, you need to write this book review. And I'm like, right. I got five other classes I need to attend to. And then he kept talking me through, well, writing is going to help you with this process. And the more you do it, the better you become at it. So for me, it was really just an opportunity to get better at where I am today as an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut. I, I think if I can just add one more piece. At that time, if, when I think about the early 2000s, there weren't many, I know at least at the, in the very least in my field, there weren't many vehicles to publication. Fast forward to today, but I, when I listened to the panel discussion, I think it was yesterday morning, and I was listening to some of the brothers talk about their research and their work. That was a time, but when we were, newly minted, we, we didn't have that space. And Brothers of the Academy was one of the first organizations that said, look, we can create the space. The book was about creating a space, a vehicle for our work and our own work. And to see now down the line where brothers are just so free to express their work using all sorts of frameworks. I mean, and that's a very, very powerful testament to, to the work that was begun in those, those earlier years. But I, I would also say that what made the organization powerful, even though we had a saying that say, earning our way in the academy, we weren't asking for handouts. Um, it's almost like what James Brown said, I ain't ask you to give me nothing, just open the door, I get it myself. But I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the elders mm -hmm. who were very influential in our development and telling us the pitfalls, you know, Dr. Joe White, which many of you all uh, uh, get to hear later on Friday, um, telling us the pitfalls of, of the academy, but not only that, sharing that different opportunity, having a Dr. Naeem Agba, a Dr. Bowman. I mean, these people have been supporting us. They've, they haven't just been at the fringes. They have been helpers and given us entree uh, to spaces that we otherwise wouldn't have. But let me just say, the elders are tough now. 
Uh, they weren't giving. You had to do some things before you, them doors start to open, uh, which is an interesting thing in our careers now. I can see some of the, you know, sometimes you hear, well, why won't X give me a chance or give so-and-so a chance? And, and this is just an anecdotal thing that um, it's kind of funny, but uh, Dr. Frierson, Hank Frierson at the University of Florida, he's the dean of the graduate school, and he has this big meeting at <laughs> AERA, and I think he, this year is the 25th year, and all the luminary black scholars, I'm talking about there's like 400 people in the room, and it's all the round tables. Well, you know, uh, Dr. Frierson invited us, I guess, three years ago, and I said, I guess we finally earned our way, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, they didn't give us any, but, but they said, we've been watching you. We like things that you're doing. And, and so I, I, I like to, I put that out there that, you know, they help brothers out, but uh, just like God, he helped people who, who want to help themselves. Thank you. So since one of the, I think, cornerstones of Brothers of the Academy was the idea of collaborative scholarship, and Sean also talked about um, in his talk as being sort of interdisciplinary as one of the RISE principles. Would um, one of you talk a minute about the role or how um, interdisciplinary work has influenced your own work? Certainly. For me, i tell you what Brothers Academy did for me. I, I did not have a, a focus on race at all in my research. So when I was doing my dissertation, it, it, it was focused on executive behavior, building on you know, principles of my major professor, the, the tra traditional ways you think about, you take a question that he or she had not quite developed and you take that and develop that along the way. Uh, and then and at that time, it was really this, uh, a lot of focus around the brown on brown taboo and this encouragement to, to, to think and ways and be mindful of those pitfalls. But, but when the, the book and the organization took root, um, we didn't only do Brothers Academy, we did other books. And the books were kind of the collaborative opportunities, but they had this focus around race. And, and the first question I had was, so, so what am I going to submit, right? And then what happened was I started you know, writing, and and the the work that had the race focus got far more attention than this other work, and then so eventually there was a point to where I was able to make a shift and um, and have my work to squarely sit around workforce diversity, workplace discrimination, um, and but it wasn't until the Brothers Academy for me uh, to to be a part of the collective project that I even uh, added it as a focus and, and I would certainly say that had that not occurred I wouldn't be able to do much of what I do today. I would say for me in, in the work that I was doing a few months before I, I joined Boda I was just moving along in the traditional mindset of you know my article you know what's my next article you know when am I going to do it and all the things that go along with that but then once I got into Boda and and had kind of this transformation in, in thinking, you know, of course my own individual work took off in new dimensions around uh, interdisciplinary work, but uh, being with uh, James and Jolando at the time when we would plan and strategize projects, it helped me think bigger about who are you gonna invite to the table to give opportunities, you know, so like the Eric Hines of the world, you know, from counseling and, you know, so many people that, you know, we would put invitations out to that if you were just in your traditional mindset, you wouldn't even think to bring, you know, the, this person in, you know, from this particular field. And, and then how it all connected together, you know, in, into a nice, well-conceptualized project. So the interdisciplinary work uh, that we did, you know, starting at that time really kind of shaped the, the impact into wider fields because 
when we would meet these brothers and, and, and meet the sisters of the academy on different projects and we roll up to these universities with the suits on and all of that and you know people think we were the football team. I don't know what they thought position I played, but <laughs> but but you know it was a it was a whole new way of thinking, you know, at that particular time uh, as well. How did Brothers of the Academy change the game? Um, I think that as we look over the landscape in the last, say, 20 years, 16 years since um, the book came out, how do you think things have changed? And what role do you think Boda played in that? I would say that when I first started, uh, I would say, particularly in the psychology realm, you know, Agbar was pretty well known, his classic book that focused on image, images and chains of psychological slavery. Um, and, and, and of course, there were a few others, Black Rage, but we were drawing, but more significantly at that time, right before we came out, uh, Dr. Majors, where's Dr. Majors, is he in here? His book, Cool Pose, it just connected to so much of what we were trying to do. And every time you turn around, I told him as recently as yesterday, I said, you should do a social citation check. Because I, I know any time that people wrote about black males, his work was always cited. Mm -hmm. And so I could say that, you know, similar to what Dr. Harper shared, that um, there was, the literature was scant at best. Uh, but most of the work around black males was primarily coming out of psychology. Uh, I'm talking about where you were getting the empirical work. But when you looked in education in general, um, it was quite scant. And so what we did, and of course there were others, James Davis, um, Polite, there were some others who I always, but I think my one of my special issues in the Journal of Men's Studies, somebody came up and told me that, I, I never thought about it, was probably one of the earliest theme issues. And now there's a proliferation of theme issues. But I, one thing I will say, what I'm disappointed in myself too, and I don't think it's a reflection of the scholars, I, I am so disappointed that when I read the work in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, even now, we're saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's the same thing because we're not original or nothing like that. I'm saying that we had made the great strides and leaps around this work. And I know that great lengths have been taken with Brothers of the Academy when we were an organization. It's not just to produce scholarship but having a hand in its dissemination. And it's just not, and that's why these kind of meetings, I know we had another conference through our teachers college issue uh, that was found chance coordinated in. So all types of different disseminations have uh, occurred, but the conditions are still the same and I'm saddened by that. I just wanna build off of what you just said, James. It's not. I wouldn't say that the conditions are still the same per se. I think there's been a deliberate and intentional rollback of freedoms that have impacted black scholars, black educators, and black people around the globe. If you remember the time that we were, were talking about the early 2000s, there was, that was the end of a cycle of, of well-funded research. The, for the last 10 years, there have been tighten screws around just the ability to produce scholarship. And so some of the, the major uh, corporate interests have consolidated, the major journals have really tightened the screws around who and what can publish. And so it's, we've had to go back to a, a form of work, time of, of activism in a sense. Um, you know, and, and I think that that's part and parcel of, of why it looks, it looks the same. And that's sad, right? I mean, even, even if you look at the Black Lives Matter and all the protests around the world around, um, around that, it's, it's really sad that we've gone back. But that's, I think, what we're fighting against. It's a new kind of frontier. I think one of the biggest things that, the biggest legacies of Buddha for me is in this room, 
I have seen so many, in, in my field, mathematics education, it's, it was 100% white, predominantly white. We had to go and create, you know, myself and, and my colleagues, another Buddha, Brian Williams, and, and with advice from brothers like Juan Gilbert, and we had to go and create a journal called the Journal of Urban Mathematics Education because there was nothing available for us to publish our work around the urban mathematics domain, black children and mathematics. Um, unless you were talking about it in such a deficit narrative way. And so what I love now about today, there are so many frameworks created by brothers and sisters that have validity and that can stand the test of time with, with just about any of the older frameworks that white folk have used to describe black experiences or black folk have had to use to describe their own experiences. And I think, I think that is a tipping point. We can't go back to that time. That's a big difference. Just more frameworks, more foundation um, than ever before. One other, one other perspective that I think is, is could easily uh, be overlooked is that stylist publishing, which many people know about now, was brand new at the time. And, and they hitched their whole future. John Van Noren his this whole future on this, this book. I mean, he put so much money into its marketing and to it doing well that uh, those of us that were in the book, we were a part of all these major book signings, this nationwide orchestrated efforts and events and things of that nature where it was hard pressed for your name not to be known in certain ways that it would have not been had it not been for the level of press that was uh, put into the book. And that was just as much about the future of stylist publishing as it is what it, about the success of that book. And uh, if you look at the catalog and how that publisher has come along, it, it really, that the book really put stylists on the map in certain ways uh, that you'll see their support in this effort, they support any announcement of Boulder. They actually published the first, their first journal was a journal that uh, Boulder started, the Journal of the Professoriate. That's a Boulder journal. It's a mainstream journal, but it's a Boulder journal that was published by Stylus. And he put a lot of time and energy into it. And so there are some artifacts out there that uh, Boda uh, has been able to contribute this out into the mainstream. Uh, so there are some other dynamics to it. And, and Stylus Publishing is an artifact now of, in some ways, what it's part of the legacy of Boda. And, and you asked about the, the takeover, I think, one of the things that was real prevalent in my mind that I remember, we were at one of the meetings and Dr. Joe White, you know, who's here, he came up to me, you know, because when the elders talk, you know, you just listen, you know, you can't really say nothing anyway. But he said, you're gonna do this book and I want it to be called this and I'm about to walk you over to the publisher and he's gonna accept it and I want you to get with this white lady in Minnesota and I want you to fly over there in two weeks, and then you do it. And then I just said, okay, all right? <laughs> and I think to today, that book is probably Stylist Publishing's best-selling book, even to this particular day, and that was my first book. But Joe White demanded, right, that we do that. But that was part of the takeover, and I, and I say that to say, from that particular point, what I learned from Joe White, then as we started to strategize, then we went, I, I would call it during that time period, full attack mode on several different outlets that had never been flooded in such a way before. Not just individual articles, but proposing projects to them that they had never seen before, like Teacher's College Record. And when we did that particular project, then we said, you know what, we're going to go all out on dissemination. We're going to create a conference around the special issue. And we were doing that conference, I think was like 2003 on black males in Denver, attracted about 200, 300 people. 
and then we had the editor there as the keynote of Teachers College Record, and you know, he said, wow, I never saw this many journals, you know, at one time because we had it as part of the registration, but we were trying to think in new ways around not only attacking different journals, but also around dissemination of our work where we can get it in the hands of the community, you know, and then uh, in that particular model, then we put the scholars on the panel with practitioners and community members at the same time when at that particular time, you know, black males weren't particularly sexy in a big way, you know, and then also having these people in the room at the same time uh, as well, talking about solutions as well. So those are just a few of the examples of how Boulder was a, oh yeah, we produced a DVD you know, of that particular conference as well. So people came to the, they came to the conference, you know, they got the special issue, <laughs> they met the executive editor, they got the CD with all the files from the conference, and there was a DVD of everybody that was there, you know, talking about the issue, you know, as well. So we tried to do a well-rounded approach to dissemination of the work that we were doing. I'll just add one final thing to your, your original prompt is how did it change the game? Because uh, I came to it a little later uh, than, than the pieces you all are talking about. So as someone who saw the potential, I, I sort of adopted it through the lens of agriculture, right? So that metaphor of planting seeds and seeing that there was quite a bit of fertile ground available and that these men were going to go on and do big and great things. And so I felt like I wanted to be in that space because I had equal ambitions. I wanted to go on and do great things. And so, as they say, game recognizes game. That was an opportunity to be amongst uh, folks who, who understood their place, who also understood the potential of what was possible. And so thinking about how these connections and relationships have blossomed over years. I'm sitting here saying, you remember you were uh, an undergrad and like, wow, like, dang, like that's, that's crazy. I remember when it first happened for me, it was really about understanding that the the way to engage is understanding that the space that you want is also the space that you need to make. Mm -hmm. And so how they did that, how we did it, was syst systematically and being intentional about sowing those seeds and setting up those relationships that are now, in my opinion, just beginning to pay dividends. I don't think we've seen the best of what Boda has to offer yet. Um, you talked about sort of the legacy of Boda and um, the influence of the elders. And would one of you speak to um, the, who doc, would you tell us who Dr. Lee Jones is and recently passed this, this summer and the role that he played in the Boda legacy? Dr. Jones. <coughs> I will put him on the Mount Everest for this work. I will put him on Mount Everest. Uh, Brother Jones occupied a space during this movement that none of us occupied. We were all young, thought we could take on the world. We thought we could do any methodology. If we couldn't, we had somebody in the room who could. But Brother Jones was the right person, which I think we are, we've never been able to recover when he, when he gave up his reign as the president, primarily because he, he was an administrator. Mm -hmm. Now, he said he was a both and, but really, mm -hmm. he was heavy administration. And so some of the service activities that came along with it and we were all junior professors, every one of us. Uh, Lee Jones was able to carry that torch. Um, Lee Jones is um, one of the most caring persons and, and, and to his own fault. Um, you know, did he benefit, right? Yeah, he benefited tremendously. Um, but Lee Jones, in my mind, I just, when I was looking at Brothers of the Academy up there, and, and Jolando said, wow, that's, that's not the right uh, logo. Then I looked at it and I said, dog, that logo kind of reminded me of the colloquium. I said, and he told me, and I was just asking, I said, was that 
conscious or unconscious of you, you know, and, um, and he said, no, he said, Brother Charleston came up with it. But many ways, Brothers of the Academy has shaped our trajectory, what we are, what we hope to be, and what it will be when we're no longer here. You know, so many different things have morphed uh, as a result of some of the leadership uh, because part of the, the movement with the book started at AERA. And that's why AERA is a symbolic space for us. And that's the place where the gathering, where brothers come together and everything. So Lee Jones, from my personal perspective, he goes on Mount Everest, at least in 2000. You know, if you can have an all-decade team, yeah. he made the all-decade team in 2000. You know, he came at a time you're talking about being an administrator, he came at a time when that's what we needed. We were, we were young, we were facing forces though who were resisting our entrance into this profession. Um, AERA, also, and for me it was NCTM, all these different kinds of organizations that were resisting our entrance into the world of scholarship. Um, and, and if you talk about legacy, just from this initial push, when you remember Gloria Latson Billings and and she helped to shape my work in the future. Um, but remember, president of AARA and, then, and, and Bill Tate, these were all legacies of Boda as well because there, it began a push for black leadership in these spaces that we had not been so publicly before. I'm not talking about the one-off. I mean a major push to really take over these kinds of organizations in, in ways that we haven't seen this year for the first time in a long time that I can remember, there's a black brother um, uh, who is actually running for the executive council uh, of the NCTM. And so for me, that's a big, sp that's the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, 100,000 members all across 80 something countries. That, that wouldn't have been possible without the work of Lee Jones in bringing brothers to a space where they could break down the doors that were still not fully open at that time. I think what I remember most from Dr. Lee Jones when we would come together, I mean, he was a very much a charismatic figure. You're just like, wow, that, that brother got it together. You know, I really need to step my game up. But one quote that he always had that I always remember, especially now as I mentor people, it was a quote he said, the bottom line is results. You know, everything else is rhetoric. <laughs> and I remember that so clearly because as we were trying to smash these doors down, he said the academy only understands your production. And so in, in taking that into what we've been able to do over the years and uh, navigating these spaces, you know, that's something that truly sticks with me because, you know, as we look at the next generation of people who are coming behind us, you know, the new and up and coming scholars, you know, that's something that I definitely would want to pass on to you that Dr. Jones gave us, is that that bottom line is results. I mean, you have to produce if you're going to be successful, you know, in this particular space, because uh, for those people who are on tenure tracks and things like that, when they close those doors and it's promotion and tenure meetings, you know, they're going to look and see what do you have, you know, at the end of the day. So that's something that uh, Dr. Lee Jones' legacy was uh, very important to us. Eric. Brother, Brother Chance, you talk about the bottom line is results, right? I, I hear that all the time in my head. I was listening to one of his DVDs a few months ago, ironically. The other thing that sticks with me is excellence without excuse. He would always say that. W one of the things that I remember most about Dr. Jones a as one of his workers and students is that he, he treated me like a graduate student and I was only a senior in college at the time. I mean, he gave me work that a graduate assistant would do, which prepared me for graduate school. The other piece that I so fondly remember is that he brought a cluster of African-American students to the College of Ed. Uh, I remember Tamara being a PhD student at the time and when you went to the College of Ed at Florida State, you would have thought it was an HBCU with all the graduate students that he brought in. So, you know, these brothers talk about sitting at the feet or listening to the elders. We were all listening to Dr. Jones, and Dr. Jones would give us access to individuals like Chance, Jolando, 
uh, and Brother James just to sit in. Although we were working, we were also learning. We were also getting to understand what the process of the professoriate was like uh, from a black lens, in, in my opinion. And I learned so much in that one year that I was with the Brothers of the Academy that it really uh, catapulted me to the PhD process. So when I got into my process, I already knew what I needed to do. Uh, you know, of course, they served as a support. Uh, and even Dr. Jones served as a support when I was in that process, when I would have questions or I would see a professor doing and saying one thing and then they would help me understand and navigate it as opposed to if I didn't have them there, I'm, I, I would have probably dropped out or went back home and just stuck to the role of a school counselor. So Brother Moore said earlier that Dr. Jones was a caring person. Dr. Jones would literally give you the jacket off of his back to help you. He would give you the resources needed to support you in your process. And that's one of the things that will continually stick with me. It, in fact, if it wasn't for Dr. Jones giving me that opportunity, I may not have access to these brothers today. Lee Jones was a visionary. He was polished, highly organized, and certainly everything else you said. What he did was he, he put forth a, a professional standard that was really helpful for a part, a profession that doesn't structure what you do and how you do. It just structures the kind of expectations that you should meet. And so he added uh, that level of structure and guidance. The one thing I'll just say is I, I had a chance to speak at his funeral on behalf of Boda. And everything we're talking about, it's the same in every other part of his life. I mean, he was that meaningful, even outside of the academy. You know, the, 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 the schools he went to, uh, everyone came up and spoke. And it's amazing how he did all of this work, but he certainly did. I'll just add, I had the pleasure, actually, of living down the street from Lee when he was uh, dean of the School of Education at University of Wisconsin Whitewater. And so I talk about sitting at the feet of the giants, right? The Titan, uh, spending time with him, listening to him, coaching, guiding, mentoring. So I kind of feel like I had my own mini crash course of what Boda was like. And it was really those conversations, those one-on-ones with Lee, that really set for me the platform that I've been able to use to try and build synergies and build bridges to help students. Some of our students we got here from Wisconsin to recognize that there's a, there's a whole lineage, right, that you are a part of, whether you want to be part of that or not, you are. And how you comport yourself and engage the issues of the day, your responsibility is to keep fighting the good fight. Mm -hmm. And that I may have played one role at one time, mm -hmm. right, but there's a different role that I play now. And so he really helped me understand that sort of evolution, both of uh, sort of responsibility, but also keeping that bar very high and expectation setting for yourself that says you can do great things, you can go on. He was, he was, he was part preacher too, so if you knew Lee, he was basically a you know, preacher professor, you know? So I you know, got a lot of the encouragement in that faith-based area, so I think about, again, that agricultural metaphor, he planted seeds, he was a seed planter, and he certainly planted some amazing seeds. I, I just I have to take a moment to tell you the story, my fondest memory. I, I um, pursued a PhD because of Dr. Jones. So I would meet with him. I was a master's student. Um, I would meet with him occasionally to, you know, I wanted to get some experience with some things. So I would say, what are you working on? What can I help you with? And he always had things going on. So I met with him this particular time. So I come for my meeting. I'm ready for my assignments. He said, you know, I need to go run upstairs. Come, come with me. I said, okay. So we go upstairs to um, one of the departments. Say, I need to talk with one of the department chairs. So we go upstairs and we get to the office of the department chair. And he says, he introduces me, he introduces her, and then he introduces me. And he says, This is Tamara Bertrand. She's interested in a PhD program. <laughs> Right, I said, so, you know, I didn't want to embarrass him, so I had to straighten my face and was like, mm, 
And so, you know, I'm looking at him like, for, for real? So he, she, said, she then says, oh, well, that's wonderful. Which PhD program is she interested in? <laughs> so I look at him, <laughs> because I don't know. I, I look at him. And so he says, well, she hasn't really decided which one. Just give her the brochures for all of them. And, she, um, and then she'll decide and let you know when she has questions. And I thought, we walked down the hall. I said, you set me up. He was like, you handled that wonderfully. But just look at, look at and figure out which one you need to decide. And I want to see a draft of your, of your um, letter of intent so that we can get you the deadline is. And I kept thinking, I'm, I'm not ready for this. I, no. I, I. And actually, I... As you said, with Dr. Joe White, yes, sir, I completed my letter of intent. So let's send it to him for a review. And then I got accepted into the program. And I know that that definitely changed the trajectory of my career. So when you think about um, just the legacy and, and for us and for the things that you're able to do, just speaking that into um, young people's lives is just amazing. I know that we are drawing to a close now, but um, what advice would you give to, we have a lot of young scholars in the room, what advice, one piece of advice would you give to these young scholars um, as they plan to make their mark on the next 20 years of scholarship? Well, first of all, make sure it's your career, not someone else's career. And something that I like to tell my students, take compliments, take criticism on the move. They both slow you down if you know where you're going. So you got to spend a lot of time thinking about what's your plan of action. Um, a lot of people, you know, and this probably because of the way I was brought up, my mother always said, you can't seek everyone's counsel. And people will always try to tell you if they were you, but they're not you and they'll never be you. And so you got to take it, it's your career. Because the academy functions like this. It's based on class arrogance and intellectual snobbery. <clears throat> when you tell them you're in a PhD program, they want to know where. Mm -hmm. And then when you tell them where's where, you make that check mark, they say, who's your advisor? If you make that check mark, they say, have you published? If you make that check mark, and they say, how many times? And then they say, where? It's, Ongoing, if you hypersensitive, this is not the job for you. Because it's one of those things you won't really ever understand it until you get on the other side. Because they keep raising the bar every, each and every time. And so I always tell people, you know, make the career that you want to have. And, uh, Fundamentally, that, that would give you the kind of career that you'll feel good about and that you uh, ultimately. And I, and I say that because Ohio State didn't always treat me good. Everybody think I'm living good now. Uh, but as my mom would say, who wouldn't treat me good if you brought $9 million to the place? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so as Dr. Lewis talked about, you've got to know fundamentally what's the academic currency of the place. If you know you don't like research and you like the teaching, then you don't need to go to a place because it's going to be uh, a tough situation for you. And I see that happen with so many young faculty members. It's about fit. I've seen people go to high price institutions and they think they can change the world, but we don't, we, we sometimes don't tell you people who go to those schools too. And so I say you want to make sure you have a fit. Don't fall in love because Professor X is or potentially be a, your colleague there and make sure you know whether, whether professional X is going to be there when you get there. And I mean, literally, sometimes these people are never in their office. Sometimes they don't provide no assistance. And I say most importantly, most importantly, if you believe in the beneficent almighty, hopefully you will continue to believe, but it's hard to believe when you're in the academy. And I say that because the reality of it is people will tell you, right, 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 right. And then you suspend this other part of your life that got you where you are. Make it both and rather than either or in the, in the journey. Thank you. You said one. <laughs> yes. 
I, I, I say learn, learn the easy way. And what I mean by that is even in here, you, you're going to ask somebody in here that you appreciate their work, advice. Listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen to the advice and understand this. You may not understand the advice today. It, you may not, it may not make sense to you until five years from now. But you still listen. Because the academy has some funny rules and procedures and protocols. And your lens may not be big enough yet to understand the advice you receive. But if you get it, and, some, and, 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 and the scholars have been around 15, 20, 30 years, it is based on some real experience. And it is likely based on experience that was shared with them. So if it doesn't make sense to you today, still listen. And the easy way is you don't have to make the mistakes that they're trying to help you avoid mm -hmm. with this advice. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do ask for the advice, use it. And let me tell you why. When you absorb their time mm -hmm. and they invest in you and you go off and you do exactly what you plan to do because all you wanted was for them to endorse what you wanted to do and it falls apart, it's going to be hard for you to go back when they've already tried to help share you, put you in the right direction. So they're wonderful sources in this room and in other places. If you get a chance to talk with them and they spend time with you, just listen. Uh, I would say that the, the academy is better because of these brothers. Your giftedness is not defined by the academy. Your giftedness is not defined by chasing tenure, chasing projects, chasing grants. The academy is better because of your giftedness, not the other way around. You have a purpose in this room that is rooted and grounded in your story. Find that purpose. Delve into that purpose. Delve into your story. Stay in love and in connection with your people. And to retain control of your authenticated self, that is what will power your success, power your purpose, and ultimately help the academy to become better than it is. And that's because of you and because of your giftedness. Uh, mine are really quick. Uh, I would say uh, get with like-minded individuals because uh, it, it will help propel you in a way that you never thought. You're going to have to learn that some people you meet you cannot do work with. But if you get with like-minded people uh, who are thinking like you and, and can push you higher, uh, I think that's something very important. And this is how it was when got with my colleagues and friends where we knew when we came together for tea time, you know, that was a session where you had to bring something to the table to push it forward as well. And my, and my last little thing real quick is that I see this so often. Don't get your identity caught up in your institution's identity. You know, so you don't have to say, my name is Chance Lewis and I'm at the University of fill in the blank. Okay, because if your, your name is, if you need that for validity, you're going to get disappointed real quick when they no longer love you. Okay, so take that because we see that all the time at ARA. Well, you know I'm at such and such. I'm like, cool. You know, and then a couple of days later after ARA, they call me and say, well, can you help me? Right, and so I don't want you to get caught up in that institutional name because you have to know who you are, know that you're a brand, and know that you have something that you can bring to the table, and the institution is lucky to have you. And that's a whole different mindset that people need to understand. Okay. I'll simply say this. Um, again, thinking about Dr. Jones, thinking about some of the comments that Brother Moore just mentioned, uh, we are people of faith, right? And not, not to be dogmatic in a sense, but being people of faith, you have always had to take faith journeys, faith walks, stepping in spaces where you didn't know what the outcome was going to be. 
but I often default back to wisdom that has been echoed in many ways here and in my life and certainly in my conversations with Dr. Jones, where there is vision, there will be provision, right? So trust the vision that you're, you're having. Trust the things that are speaking not only to your, your intellectual curiosity, but that are also tugging at your heart and your moral convictions, right? The work that we do often intersects in those spaces most when we think about how we respond to our communities, particularly our communities in crisis. So understanding that there is a larger force uh, that is at play and how you respond to that larger force is critical. And to the extent that you build support systems, right, not just in your advisors or your mentors, but that you have folks, like, like you're saying, that are part of a similar mindset of philosophy, embrace that, support that, but trust that vision because when it comes, the provision will also be soon following. I'll, I'll be brief as well. Uh, I, I think these brothers up here, they gave a lot of wisdom and advice. And honestly, these are conversations that they have with me in public as well. Brother Moore always tells me, even to this day, comments and criticism on the move, Eric. Comments and criticism on the move. So one of, one of the things that I would like to add is commitment. You know, going to grad school, if you decide to become an academic or even on the staff side or administrator side, it takes commitment. How are you improving in your craft every day? Are you reading about what you're interested in or in the uh, field of the position that you're fulfilling? And how do you get over discouragement? There, there will be people, I mean, some of us call them haters, out there who will try to stop you from doing what you're committed to or what you believe you're called to do. So put people in place that will be supportive of you, make sure that you're doing um, what you need to do to be successful, but also understanding that is your role more of your purpose or is it something that you want to do? And I think that's probably the bigger picture. How does your role fit into your purpose in the academy? And that will sustain you in terms of what you want to do and what you want to fulfill in your career. Thank you so much. Thank you, brothers, for this sort of journey down memory lane for Brothers of the Academy. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Brothers of the Academy, um, I think the newest website is bodaportal.org. Um, we can make sure that you get that information. But um, would you join me in giving a round of applause for our <laughs> panelists?